content lecture. Um, so just a little bit about me, Andrew Cave. Believe it or not, I was not sent back from NYU for remediation. Um, I'm actually attending uh, at NYU like Zone and Lutheran these days. Um, so I always like to start with a patient and get introduced to the topic. Uh, so this is actually someone I had recently. Uh, she's a 30-year-old female. She was brought in by her boyfriend and father for kind of just acting odd, questionable whether or not she was hallucinating. She's been getting more agitated lately. Um, she doesn't really have much in the way of past medical history, you know, whether it be a site or anything like that, not doing a bunch of drugs, not taking a bunch of, uh, you know, weight loss drugs or anything like that. Um, so simple, right? Hallucinations, young person, call site, right? John, check them off your list, move on to your giant waiting room because this is New York City and it's the beginning of the day. Everyone's coming in to see you. All right, but you're working with me and you're a good doctor and this is kind of your response to my plan. <laughs> All right, so we actually take a look. All right, she's tachycardic. All right, she's agitated. She's kind of won't really sit still. She's talking pretty quickly, um, doesn't quite give a linear thought process, um, has a little bit of pressure of speech. Um, and when you actually look at her and you kind of ask her to hold her hands out, she actually has these kind of fine tremors, very thin looking woman. Um, so you actually confirm your suspicion. So she's Q-tox negative, UCG negative, but her TSH is undetectable. Um, given that lab abnormality and the signs and symptoms that we have, we diagnose her with hyperthyroidism. Um, right, but hyperthyroidism, you know, is relatively easily treated unless you have this life-threatening uh, complication called thyroid storm. Um, it's more of a clinical diagnosis. Um, the levels of the thyroid hormone or TSH isn't actually all that important. It's more what she, uh, the patient actually looks like, the vital signs, what their symptoms are, right? So tachycardia, agitation, um, decreased alertness. Um, and we actually have this nice uh, birch Wartowski uh, score. Um, so we kind of run through our patient here. She was a febrile, but she wasn't at 90 to 99.9, so we gave her a five there. She was tachycardic to the 120s, so we gave her a 15 there. Uh, she didn't have aphid, she didn't have signs of congestive heart failure. She was having some uh, mild GI upset, which tacked on another 10. Um, and she was having some delirium psychosis, which added on another 20. Um, I didn't have any sort of precipitating uh, syndrome. She had no other previous history, so she gets another 10 for having this kind of un, uh, unprecipitated uh, fibro, uh, fibrotoxicosis. All right, so what does this score system mean? Right, if I have under 25 when I add up all my math, all right, it's thyrotoxicosis, very low suspicion for thyroid storm. Um, so when you has a much less chance of having uh, significant morbidity and mortality from this acute event. All right, greater than 45 is high likelihood that this person is uh, in thyroid, uh, thyroid storm. All right, so what's happening with our toxicosis and thyroid storm? I can tell you that the thyroid storm activates transmembrane uh, receptors signaling protein reception, which increases gene transcription or I can do something that's a little bit more simple for me to understand. Really what it does is it just upregulates your adrenergic receptors. All right, meaning that you are now much more sensitive to your circulating catecholamines. All right, particularly the beta one. All right, so what's the big deal? Their heart rate goes a little fast, she's a little agitated, she's losing weight, great. Um, right, but there are actual complications with this, right? You can have CHF, congestive heart failure. All right, you can have tachy dysrhythmias. All right, ultimately all these things can lead to cardiovascular collapse. Um, I like that one too. Um, and then ultimately, right, it can actually lead to death. All right, left untreated, it's almost ubiquitously fatal. All right, so I have a mortality of 90% or greater. All right, so we diagnose with thyroid storm, we know that it has a high mortality, we're kind of worried, right? What's gonna happen? I have, this is, this is something, what do I do? What do I do, 
right? All is not lost, believe it or not. Um, when treated, all right, we can actually get the mortality down to 10 to 20%. Dr. Sinner, I think I did this correctly. If I take 90% and I subtract 10%, my absolute risk reduction is 80%. And then if I have one over 0.8, I get 1.25 in terms of a number needed to treat. That might be the best I've ever run into. I don't think there's much else in, in medicine that is actually that effective. Um, all right, so this is the ED. What are we going to do with this patient? All right, just like Sally had just mentioned with mixedema coma, very much the same thing with ED we stabilize. So we're going to do our ABCs, IVO2 monitor. Um, if this patient is in CHF, has pulmonary edema, we're going to give them respiratory support either with supplemental oxygen, NIV, or if we have to, we intubate. All right. Um, fluid resuscitation, cardiac monitoring, because again, these people do have a high likelihood of uh, tachydysrhythmias. All right, so we did all that. All right, but now we're actually going to do some treatment that is specific to thyroid storm. Um, does anybody know who this guy is? He can't even tell, all right. So he was one of the defensive greats. Um, and with his characteristic finger wag, he recently became famous again for these guy go commercial. He was the one who was running around in the uh, supermarket slapping the kid's cereal box out of him and going, no, no, no. Um, so he's the second time all the uh, NBA all-time leading block. He had 3,289 blocks. We only need to remember four things. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to block the receptor effects. We're going to block the production of new thyroid hormone. We're going to block the release of stuff that was already made, and we're going to block our conversion from T4 to T3. All right, so those, those are the four blocks I want you to remember that are specific to thyroid storm. All right, so we're going to block our receptor effects, right? It's kind of a, we have this upregulation of adrenergic, specifically beta um, adrenergic receptors, so beta blockers are a completely reasonable choice. All right, typically or classically, uh, it's propranolol, either IV or PO. Um, IV, you can start with uh, one milligram IV and then kind of redose it uh, to uh, get a better control on their heart rate. Um, if for whatever reason you don't want to do propranolol, there's also metoprolol, atenolol. Um, Esmolol is uh, nice if they aren't taking PO, it's kind of quick on, quick off, pretty specific to uh, your beta ones. All right, if the beta blockers are a no no for whatever reason, you can try diltiazem. Um, and reserpine. Reserpine, um, I actually have to look it up. What it does is it prevents your catecholamines in your presynaptic uh, neuron to not get loaded up into the vessel to be spit out into the synapse. And then your the uh, nerve just winds up digesting. So instead of blocking the receptor, you're actually just wiping out the catecholamine. All right. Next, you want to block the production. All right, we have uh, these thiamine DDDs um, or PTU with them as all. Um, again, uh, typically, classically, it's from PTU that you're going to get a little faster onset, uh, has a more uh, a quicker reduction in circu uh, circulating uh, thyroid hormones at uh, 24 hours. It's preferred in your first trimester of pregnancy. Um, your uh, prothyroid thyroid although does have liver toxicity. It's one of the black box warnings that we all need to be aware of. Um, so obviously they have liver uh, injury or failure in their history. We'll probably start with our Um Talking more recently with my ICU and my endocrine guys, um, if they are not intubated in any sort of extremist, a lot of times they will give them Um PTU also does have the added benefit that it helps to block conversion from T4 to T3. Um, but either one is good. All right, next we're going to block our, re our release. And to do that, we're going to give an inorganic uh, iodine solution, either your Lugol solution or your saturated solution of potassium iodine. Um, and what that actually does is the inorganic iodine um, prevents further release of the already made uh, hormone. Now, the thing that you need to be kind of cognizant of and aware of is iodine is a key substrate for right, triodothyroxine is T3, the active uh, ingredient. Um, so if you give a big iodine load without taking the 
mechanism, a way to create the thyroid hormone, you're actually going to get increased levels. Right? So it's very important that you give your either Dimazol or PTU first at least one hour prior to giving your iodine solution. All right? And now you're going to block your conversion. All right? You're already ahead of the game because you gave your beta, your beta blockers, or maybe you gave some PTU, but we can always augment that. All right? You can always add a little bit of steroids. All right? Hydrocortisone, dexamethasone, either one. Stop. 